I'm John Messina, and welcome to another edition of Hey Coach. I know it's kind of tough to get guests, especially when we're retired, and I got <laughs> I got I got I got to tape this show in the morning. Everybody else is working, but I good I got my good friend Michael Stutsky coming back here again. I know last time we ran out of time; we had so many things to talk about. Uh, Michael, a little bit about your background. Well, John, uh, we, we've been colleagues for a very long time. I retired uh, two years ago from, uh, it'll be two years, July 1st, from Sebastian River High School. I was there for 22 years in public education for almost 27. And uh, I've been enjoying retirement uh, to and from the farm out in Illinois. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, life is good, but it's always good to be, uh, be around a good friend and to talk uh, about uh, a profession that uh, we're both uh, passionate about. Right, and, and I want to congratulate you. I know you've been nominated for the Florida High School Hall of Fame, and that's something I think you're very, very deserving of getting into. Well, well, thank you. I, I'm, I'm honored to just to be nominated. And, uh, um, you know, sitting across from someone who is in the Hall of Fame, uh, it would be an honor to, to, to be part of that. But, but like I said, just to be nominated, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 extremely, uh, I'm extremely honored. Well, I put my two cents in on that, you know, and... Um, when you get up there, and, and I'm pretty sure you're going to get in and nominated, and that was one of the, the highlights of my career, not just the award itself, but, but, you know, getting all the letters and the emails from your former players, and you're looking around and you see people like George Smith from St. Thomas and Chipper Jones, who's in the Baseball Hall of Fame, and uh, even George Steinbrenner's in the Florida Hall of Fame, Chris Everett, you know, great professional athletes. People that we know for years who have been in there, and you look around, and you say, "Why me?" You know, but it, it, it's very, very rewarding. But uh, there's been so many changes over the years in high school athletics, yeah, and you and I always talk about how easy it was to get kids cleared. And, and let's tell everybody about our famous pink sheets. Oh goodness gracious! Uh, well. Um, we remember them because uh, it was it was the best way to do it. Yes. I mean, I look back on it. You know, technology is great, yes. but there was something about um, uh, athletic directors being able to, uh, along with their head coaches, to look exactly with what was sent to this to uh, to the FHSA. Yeah. But I think you're. This, you're, you're, you're going back to the time when you came up on the campus and we had to. Yes. Get, I'll yes. never forget it. You, yeah. you you got off the bus and you said. Uh, we, we've got to uh, work on something here with one of my student athletes. I said, fine and dandy. I said, uh, let's head into my office. Yeah. It was a football game. Yes. We rode, uh, rode in on the old golf cart, got to the desk, and on the way in, we yeah. were talking about, uh, you know, the, the pink the, sheets. The pink sheets. And yeah. I said, you know, John, I still have kept mine. You know. And uh, I went in the file, and I showed you. We had a good laugh over it. Yeah. And we said, you know, back in the day, you always knew the eligibility of your kids. Yes. And it was always quick to reference it yes. because you didn't have to worry about whether or not a computer was down or whether it was entered correctly. You had that slip of paper, and you knew exactly where you stood with your student. There was athlete. no fax machine. No fax There was no email. That's right. There was no anything you got. We used to send things on carbon copy through yes, the mail. Did. And, and uh, I did a seminar in, in, I think it was in July, for about 300 ADs at Centennial all around the area. And I brought out your pink sheets. And I asked them how many knew what I was going to talk about. And I said, we used to be able to clear a kid in five minutes, you know. Right. But, but there's been so many changes. And, and, and one of the, you know, we're going to talk about a bunch of them. And, and one of them is the influence of outside club sports and outside teams now that's kind of taken away from high school sports. Absolutely. And I think that we saw this uh, really begin about uh, 10 years ago. And now you have uh, young people that have been influenced by club sport coaches uh, that the only way that they'll earn a scholarship is if they play in club sports. Um, students are making the choice to do club sports as opposed to representing their high school team uh, or they're trying to do both. And and we both know that out of that sometimes comes injuries that uh, it's hard to ascertain whether they happened on the high school team or the club team. Uh, but it has it sent a confusing message, in my humble opinion, to student athletes and their parents as to where the best opportunities are for them uh, when it comes to being looked at by colleges. Uh, personally, frankly, I always believe that uh, a student who competed for their high school and like competition uh, that's what college and university 
uh, coaches yeah. have shared with me over the years is that they wanted to see who these kids were competing against at their public or private or combination mm -hmm. schools. Not to say that they wouldn't give credence or credibility mm -hmm. to club programs, but the high school programs is what they really wanted to look at and see how well that student athlete was um, doing as part of their high school program. And you know, a, a lot of times it conflicts during the season. And I know a lot of times, a lot of the soccer coaches say, you know, well, we don't have our full team because some of them have to play you know, their club teams during that time, or volleyball or softball, and it, it really makes it hard. I remember I went to a, a seminar uh, that the FHSA put on about 15 years ago, and Billy Donovan, who's the coach of Oklahoma City Thunder right now, was at the University of Florida, and he spoke to, there was a lot of parents up there, there was a lot of ADs, a lot of coaches, and Billy said one thing, he says, you know what, you guys are worried about being seen. Every major sport, every, excuse me, every major college has somebody who that's their job to go find you. You know, he says, don't worry about stats. Don't worry about your name in the paper. Get good grades. Do the right thing. And we'll find you on, on that. But it, it, it's been so hard. And, and you know, some of the, the outside coaches are absolutely great. But I think a lot of times what's missing is the sportsmanship lately. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you have seen this a lot of times with with the pro athletes a lot of times even with the college athletes you know how many people are being ejected I know I know you and I always pushed our schools for sportsmanship I know the, the greatest thing that I ever had at Centennial is that we had three state sportsmanship awards in eight years and it's a very very high honor and it's so hard to teach the kids the right thing with sportsmanship because sometimes they're looking at the role models up at the pros and up in college and they're not there True, and I think that one of the disadvantages student athletes are at when they're part of club programs, that these club programs are made up of kids from all over. Yes. And uh, it's a lot easier for a coach in a mentoring capacity to instill sportsmanship qualities on their team and, it make, it, and make it part of the school's fabric. Um, you mentioned uh, the three um, uh, sportsmanship awards that Centennial received. And Sebastian, we only received one during my, my tenure as the athletic director, but, but that is the most important banner that hangs in the gymnasium right. at Sebastian. Right. Um, and if you, if you have good coaches, um, that, that policy of the, the expectation yeah. of good sportsmanship is going to be there. And I think that's what kids get out of being part of their high school program as opposed to club programs where... They're, the ownership of the program itself is, is with so many right. people and not just my school and the things that I need to do to represent my school and my team properly. And right. And, I and, think that's lost with, with uh, club programs. And, and one of the things that the FHSAA is trying to control has been the seven-on-seven -seven football, okay, because it's kind of been out of control over the summer. You know, kids are switching schools, not to say they're switching schools for any reason now, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, kind of shady things going on in that. A lot of good things, but a lot of things that they need to control. So they're trying to put the seven-on-seven seven into an actual sport for high schools, which, which is going to be kind of tough because you and I know the spring season could be, could be really tough on that, you know. For sure. And that, now another thing, too, is over the years, you have seen the amount of multi-sport players decline rapidly. Mm. People want to specialize. Why is that? Well, I, you know, that was a question I asked myself so many times because you have a talented individual who uh, plays volleyball and then they say, well, we're going to play club volleyball, uh. but they're not going to be part of the basketball team or the softball team or the track and field program at their school. And it hurts a school's athletic program. Yeah. I mean, that's the first and foremost yeah. thing. It just does. You have students that are specializing because, I believe, in many instances, they feel that their only true path to a college scholarship yeah. is if they play their given sport, the one that they are most passionate about year-round. I don't think that the data uh, supports that. I think that uh, college coaches today, at least the ones that I've spoken with, they're looking for the well-rounded student athlete, and I think one of the most important components is that if you're a multi-sport athlete, then you have been coached by multiple individuals from a head coaching perspective. I think it's important for student athletes to understand that not every coach is the same. It is good to experience uh, another 
perspective of coaching. Yeah. And you see that uh, with those students who have been multiple sport athletes. Um, and I, I think there's a, definitely a, a correlation between those that are multiple sport athletes and their overall perspective on their high school experience as and, well. And another topic just going into that is the safety issue. I mean, so many trainers, athletic trainers and doctors have said because you're playing the same sport over and over again, you're using the same muscles. Okay? Well, that's, that's a, that is an excellent point. And I, I go back to the trainer that um, we had uh, have at, at Sebastian River, uh, Hillary Lang. Uh, Hillary always stressed that because uh, she was right uh, there on the front uh, line. She saw the injuries uh, and the repetitiveness uh, in, in certain injuries that are inherent to that uh, single sport athlete at school. So that's an excellent point. And, uh, you know, baseball probably has the lead on it, which, which, you know, these young men, you know, pitching over and over, pitching in the summer, pitching in the fall, pitching during the season, and they're using the same muscles. And the amount of injuries for baseball pitchers has just skyrocketed. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned baseball. I mean, and, and obviously I know why you're passionate, you're, you're a baseball coach. But one thing that I'll never forget was that one of our games, a, a father came up to the press box where our, the head coach was. Um, and, and it was during a junior varsity game. Mm -hmm. And the father came up and he turned to the coach and he said, you need to pull my son. He's above his pitch count. And, you know, I, I looked over at the coach and, and, I, and I looked at the parent and I thought, Goodness gracious, here we have that helicopter parent, that micromanagement of that student athlete, and yet the father was well aware of the fact that because his son plays yeah. ball outside of the high school program, that that yeah. stress that you just mentioned yeah. in one particular area of yeah. that young athlete's body is being taxed to the max. And when that happens, obviously you end up with some very serious injuries. And, and one thing the FHSAA put in the last two years has been a pitch count. Mm -hmm. And the only problem with that is they don't get involved in it. The umpires don't get involved in it. You have to be your own guidelines on that. And it's tough. And uh, I went out to the state finals last year out in Fort Myers. And at the state finals, the FHSA took over. And they pulled. We, we saw a bunch of games out there. And twice they pulled a pitcher on the pitch count whose team was winning. And the coach went to them and said, wait a minute. Nobody regulated this all year, and the FHSA came back and said, well, you're supposed to. Yeah. And they pulled those kids, and both of those teams ended up losing. And it mm -hmm. was like a shock to them. So that's something I, I, I think this year you have to report it online on max preps, but I still think there's got to be a better system. I know what they're trying to do. And, and you and I have, have talked about this for years, about the safety in athletics and how valuable an athletic trainer is, you know? Because, Absolutely. you know, all this about concussions, it's just something 20 years ago we never talked about. And I, I, I know you can have trainers at games, but concussions can occur anytime. And I think you were the one that always talked to me about soccer. Yes. How many Absolutely. concussions can come in soccer? And because a lot of these concussions can occur away from the play, people might not notice them. Absolutely. I, I, I think every time um, that I witnessed a young man or a young lady in soccer um, uh, produce, if you will, a header, yeah. you know, I always thought to myself, I mean, okay, a couple times a game, multiply that by X amount of games yeah. and practices, and then their club programs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the data hasn't come out in soccer, but it will. And I certainly feel that down the line, that it will be mandatory for, at least at the high school level, for headgear to be worn by uh, male and female soccer players. We've certainly seen it with lacrosse. Um, you know, in, in the beginning, they didn't have the girls wearing any form of headgear. Now, the girls wear it in lacrosse and the boys don't. So oh, the boys where they boy, were now they, they now were, they were head, okay yes. okay but when we first yeah. started uh well at sebastian we yeah. started uh, girls lacrosse in 96 and there was no checking above the shoulders okay and it was not um the girls were uh i yeah. uh, i wear uh but then a few years ago this push came for uh protection of the head and rightly so yeah. and uh, you know a lot of the teams uh programs they didn't want to have headgear the, the girls didn't uh, they didn't feel comfortable with it and in some instances some girls were brave enough to say look let me just put it to you this way it's not fashionable well, you know? well, well think about this way before a lot of our viewers time 
Go back and watch old hockey games in the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. They never wore helmets. They never wore helmets. The, the goalies never wore masks. That's exactly they didn't right. They did not last too long, but, you know, they, they, they never. And, and thank goodness today, yeah. that, you know, with, with, with the research that's yeah. done, that, yeah. that we have these protective measures in yeah. place. Absolutely. Say one thing, and I always think, you know, if, if I was ever in charge of the FHSA or you were ever in charge of the SA, FHSA, some of the mandatory things that you put in, coaches have to have training, and they have to have training on safety issues. And it's not a 20-minute class online that nobody pays attention to or you get your friend to fill it out, okay? you got to go to a class that should be an all-day in service. You know, uh, our good buddy Jay Stewart, who was the athletic director in this county for many years, great person, used to say, you know, John, it's not a problem until it's a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think a lot of us are lacking in the safety issues. It's so important with the dehydration, with the concussions, with, with so many other things. I mean, is a coach really trained for 20 minutes on a video that okays him with the high school association to coach, and then he's out at football or soccer or wrestling practice. That's not his job to diagnose a concussion, you know? You Absolutely. Know, I know my last few years, as soon as somebody got hit in the head, I said, you're done, you know? I mean, you're not going back out to practice. I don't care what happened. You know, go see, we didn't have trainers, but go see this doctor. If it was at a football game, we went to see the ambulance people, the EMTs that were there at that time. But it gets scary in a way because I think we know more. You well, know? we do know more. And I think that one of the, and, and it, has, it was never very popular when yeah. it was brought up in, in years past. But ask yourself this question. Before we allow yeah. a teacher to stand in front of a group of students and teach them, the teacher yeah. must be certified. Right. Coaches must be certified. And there are certification right. programs available in this country that school districts should embrace. Right. And coaches, whether they've coached five years or 50 years, should never feel as though additional training will not be helpful to them in being an even better coach. But until such time is that it's mandated, that it's not, as you said, sitting in front of a computer, which somebody else could sit in front of that right. computer for you, and you click it, you've done with it, here's your certificate, okay, all well and good. It has to be a bona fide certification program where there is legitimate classroom time for that coach. Uh, here in the state of Florida, as we both know, you can qualify for a temporary coaching certificate. Uh, you know, that's a green light to be responsible for the health, safety, and welfare of young people. But you're taking those classes online again. And, 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 and you know, and I took some of them too. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's fine, you learn things, but it's not the same being in a classroom with a, with a doctor and an athletic trainer who can explain these to and you can back and forth you know well that that's true and i i think that school districts are in the position to make this happen by yeah. bringing in yeah. the right facilitators and instructors yeah. and making it mandatory that yeah. over the course of a of an yeah. academic year that the coaching staff once a month comes into the district sure. office for for instruction and when someone says well you know i can't come because it's baseball season well let's you, be you can miss one you practice miss one you can miss one practice and and you know we used to have the, the in-services here in St. Lucie County, and I thought they were terrific. You know, mm -hmm. J.J. did a great job with, with all of them. But then a lot of the football coaches complain, well, we're missing a day of practice. I said, well, you can gladly miss a day of practice. All okay? you have to do, John, yeah. is, is to lose a student athlete. And yeah. the two of us are probably the only ones on so, the Treasure Coast, right. thank God, yeah. that, uh, that uh, we unfortunately both lost, we both lost student right. athletes. And once that's happened, yeah. it puts a lot of things right. in perspective. So yeah. I think having yeah. a certification program is extremely important. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the student athlete that we lost at, at Centennial was Jessica Clinton, and her mother, Cheryl Lulu, has been an absolute advocate of all the having the defibrillators on campus. Mm -hmm. And she has been just a wonderful, what she does for this state, campaigning about the awareness Mm -hmm. uh, with the defibrillators has just been been terrific but and and there's another thing too that i think we forget too i think we we overplay or over schedule um, how, how can i say this high school football here is fantastic i love it you love it everything else but if you think it is you play a preseason game you play 10 regular season games okay then if you go all the way to the state playoffs, that's five more. Now you're at 16. Mm -hmm. A lot of these teams 
were getting permission to play bowl games. That's 17. That's more than the NFL, mm -hmm. okay? And, and I know, Michael, you and I always stuck to our guns on this. We were one of the few people that did this. Makeup games, okay? Mm -hmm. The NFL Player Association has been complaining about the Thursday night game. So a lot of times the FHSA, and it's really not them, it's, it's, it's pressure from a lot of other things. When you get rained out, they want you to play a Friday, a Monday with the rain out game, and another Friday. I know you and I had that opportunity twice, mm -hmm. and we said no, and we were able to convince our football coaches no why, okay? You can't, you can't recover quick enough, and you might not be able to pick that up. I know there was a lot of amount of rain outs on, on, in this area last year and throughout the whole of the state with the hurricanes. And I heard there were people going on, they were going uh, Friday, Tuesday, Friday. And I'm saying to myself, how can that be? You know? Yeah. Why would you sacrifice the yeah. development, the health, safety, and welfare yeah. of a teenager yeah. or the egos yeah. of adults yeah. that want to see a game played? Yeah. And I think sometimes yeah. that's what we are faced with. Uh, if you want to look at a really good coach, yeah. look at the coach that says, okay, the rule says I can have 20 competitions or I can right. have 25 competitions, right. but he or she has 18 competitions and their programs are just as competitive. I, I, and they understand yes. that it doesn't have to be how many games or matches yeah. I can have, but the quality of the games and matches right. and giving my student athletes the opportunity to recover from not only all of the practices, but the competition it's not, to get ready for the it's next It's not week. as many, it's the quality. The quality. And, and, and uh, I was up in New Jersey in the end of November visiting my parents, and I went to my hometown football game, and I was talking to the coach up there, and they were in the playoffs, and I looked at their record, and it was, they were in the third round of the playoffs, and they were nine and three. I'm saying, boy, you must have got a, bunch of games rained out or, or you know canceled I said did you get bad weather up here he says no we're down to eight regular season mm -hmm. football games now I know people yell it's a money maker and this and that but look at the safety issues okay and, and and another thing that hurts too is how many of these sports overlap that's another reason that we don't have the multi-sport athletes like we do Very now true. Very you know true. And, and, and you know baseball has been pushed and, and I'm glad I'm not on the committees anymore. Into first week of June, most of the high schools are done or have graduation middle of May now. Sure. So there were schools that were playing in the baseball state championship. And I was wondering, you know, when we went out to Fort Myers, there's no crowds here. Just, we finished school three weeks ago. Sure. It's hard to, to get the crowds. John, out. we both remember. And, and for those, and, and yeah. you don't have to be yeah. an old salt like us, right. but there was a time yeah. in the state of Florida when your fall sports ended, there was a week yes. or maybe 10 days before yes. winter sports started. Right. Right. And then the same gap before spring right. sports started. And it gave kids, it gave families, it gave schools a chance to catch their breath. And I really, really believe that there would be many more young people that would be multiple sport right. athletes if they had a chance to kind of catch up a little bit on the academic right. side, catch up a little bit on the social side, and then go, yeah. oh, and next week, yes. I'm going to have tryouts for basketball or soccer. And let everybody whatever. take a breather. For take a, a breather. Right. If we did it once, yeah. we could do it again. Sure. And in the few minutes we got left, because you know how fast this show goes, tell me about the Sports Commission and what they got going on. Absolutely. A lot of good things, okay? Well, uh, on April the 30th, which okay. is a Monday evening, okay. at the... Um, Sunrise Theater okay. uh, in Fort Pierce, we will once again have our Scholar Athlete Awards. We're excited about it. It's 7 o'clock, uh, again, at Sunrise Theater. Um, each athletic director along the Treasure Coast is asked to uh, provide us with the name of a male and female Scholar Athlete from okay. their program. And now, are, on the Scholar Athlete, what are the qualifications? Qualifications. We want uh, a multiple sport athlete. Okay. We would like to see a student athlete with a, at least a 3.0, hopefully a 3.5 or better. A student who has exemplified what a student athlete is all about on their campus. The award was established so that high school athletic directors, who better to know a school's athletic program than the athletic director, to, to single out a male and a female on, that is part of their program and to give them public recognition. 
Um, we started it five years ago. The last two years we've had this formalized assembly, if you will. This will be the third year. Um, something that's being added this year is the Florida Athletic Coaches Association will present their awards that night as well. And, and we think this is great because in the past it was done at the individual schools, but um, now it will be done publicly, so we're excited to have them. Something special this year. Uh, we all know that we had a student athlete out of Lincoln Park, uh, Lane Chesney, right. who was uh, severely injured in a fire uh, back in December. The Treasure Coast Board, uh, Treasure Coast Sports Commission uh, Board of Directors um, uh, voted to take all of the proceeds, all of the proceeds from the ticket sales this year and donate that to the Lane Chesney. That's wonderful. Um, That's wonderful. It is. And, and this young lady, as yeah. she battles through the yeah. horrific situation that she's faced with, uh, family, friends, and medical folks have said that it's because she was an athlete right. and in such good shape that she has been able, and with that intestinal fortitude, has been fighting uh, to, to come out of this terrible ordeal. And so we were able to underwrite this year's awards, and that way we could give every dime that is collected uh, to Lane's fund for her recovery. And the last two years has been a complete sellout, right? It it's has. Some, it's it, been it, a wonderful, yeah. Yeah. really has been a wonderful presentation. It's a great way to bring these student athletes together. Last year we started, uh, we, we added an additional award, which was the recognition of the coach of the year right. on the Treasure Coast. And uh, we look forward to doing that again this year. Um, our executive director, Rick Hatcher, and his staff yeah. are putting the event together. and. We're very excited and, uh, to not only put this event on, but it further uh, puts the Treasure Coast Sports Commission out in front of our community and all of the things that the commission does. Right. So, how do you like retirement? I love, you love it. You love it? I love it. I do. Right. Um, I miss the kids. Yes. I said the same thing on the way over in yeah. the car, right? Yeah. I, I think we both miss the yeah. student athletes. There's something alive. about that interaction. Yeah. Uh, I miss coaches. Yes. Um, but, yeah. you know, we also commented in the car that, uh, and I know in my particular yeah. case, I never watch an entire football game in 22 years because we're always right. working. Right. Now we, see, yeah, somebody, now we get to see them. <laughs> I remember somebody said, said to me, he says, what's the score during the game? I said, I don't know. I says, you know. Look at the scoreboard. That's look, what I do. Look, look at the scoreboard. <laughs> I, I miss there, There's so many things we miss as athletic directors. And I, I, I think, you know, sometimes we realize how how wonderful our job was. You don't yes. realize it when you're working, but you interact with so many different people. I mean, the parents, you know, the different coaches from different schools, and it's something I really miss. And, uh, you know, again, I want to thank you. Because it's you, hard Jeff. getting people when I tape in the morning. i got to get one of my retired buddies. Most definitely. But, but thank Always you again for coming in, and thank everybody for another edition of Hey Coach.